Okay, good morning, Ayla, and good morning. thanks for uh, joining me in this conversation about the crisis in Sri Lanka. So, we are all familiar with the kind of immediate manifestations of the crisis that uh, Sri Lanka is facing a problem, that there are things that uh, it is not self sufficient in, which it has to purchase from the rest of the world, and it immediately has a problem that it doesn't have the foreign exchange resources for buying these items. Therefore, there are shortages that are hitting every section of uh, Sri Lankan society. But obviously, the crisis has a history. It's not something that has emerged immediately. So what's your view on how this particular crisis has kind of developed over time and what are its real origins? Yeah. Well, if you have a sort of a long durée uh, view of this, um, you know, Sri Lanka went through almost 500 years of colonialism. First the Portuguese, then the Dutch, then the British. And they created a dependent economy. Um, of course, focused on the plantation sector and uh, exports, and then dependent on that, imports. And even with independence in 1948, um, soon after that, actually, the World Bank came on a mission to Sri Lanka in 1950. And they wrote this extensive report, you know, a thousand page report called the Economic Development of Ceylon, where they again wanted us to focus on agricultural production for exports. And they really discouraged us from industrializing. So that set the trajectory again towards this import dependent economy. Now, from 1956, Till about 76, uh, we had an import substitution regime where they tried, you know, state corporations in some amount of local manufacturing, trying to diversify. But the 1970s crisis, the, the long downturn globally, made it very difficult for that left-oriented government to take off. But, but that was a time when uh, this idea of self-sufficiency was first starting to come up in Sri Lanka, but it was short-lived with the OPEC oil shock, and there was a reaction against that left-leaning government, which gave uh, the new J.R. Jayawardena government a landslide victory, and he decided to liberalize uh, the economy, the first country in South Asia to liberalize, and what he called open economy. And with his uh, almost five, six majority in parliament, uh, decided to set Sri Lanka on this neoliberal trajectory. But along with that also created a very repressive neoliberal state. So he needed that also to push through. He smashed the unions in the uh, general strike of uh, July 1980 and went ahead with liberalization of agriculture, so even our food system. I remember as a child, you know, I think probably well before India, we had supermarkets with imported goods. So that was the trajectory of the economy set, and that continued. Of course, with the civil war, uh, successive governments, even though they were on the neoliberal path, couldn't go as fast. They couldn't accelerate their liberalization program. It's only at the end of the war, in May 2009, uh, that again, a very strong regime, Rajapaksa, Mahinda Rajapaksa, uh, decided to bring about what he called stability and set it again on a development path, which, you know, I, I've written about it in the EPW, calling it the second wave of neoliberalism in Sri Lanka, with huge amount of capital coming in, but continued with that uh, trade liberalization uh, trajectory. So, on the one hand, our economy was getting financialized, Two, we were becoming more and more dependent on imports. And I think it's these two factors that have really culminated in this crisis. Dependency on foreign loans and dependency on imports that has culminated in the current crisis where we have now defaulted on our debt. We can't pay back our debt. And we don't have enough foreign exchange to uh, import even essential goods. 
So you're saying that uh, liberalization in the case of Sri Lanka kind of clearly established that it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the kind of principle of competitive advantage applies and you'd find success in some fields of exports in order to finance the areas where you have imports. So Sri Lanka's case is uh, kind of case in point that that doesn't necessarily happen and uh, it became an import dependent economy and therefore also dependent on the other side of liberalization which was capital flows. Am I correct in uh, that understanding? That's right. And but also there was this very powerful ideology um, through our think tanks, but also really coming from the West and the World Bank and the IMF, that there should be unrestrained trade liberalization. There should be no restrictions on imports. And so it, it, it's one thing to say, okay, we will use our export earnings to import certain goods, which a country like Sri Lanka, we have to. Right? We can't produce all the goods in, in Sri Lanka. But this idea that anything, so if you look at the last uh, 12 years, what I call the second wave of neoliberalism, suddenly you saw the whole transformation of Colombo, you know, focus on the beautification of the city, building up real estate, with all these, you know, when you look at a hotel, all the fixtures are imported. You look at Colombo, the number of luxury cars, BMWs, Mercedes Benzes, and now we don't have fuel for even uh, three wheelers and uh, motorbikes. But so that idea that we should not, uh, in any way, restrict imports was also part of that. So that powerful ideology that has became much more prevalent, in addition to a uh, dependency. So what do you say that trade liberalization or the history of trade liberalization in Sri Lanka is something that may have actually come in the way of developing its export base itself, that it didn't allow the creation of a reasonably strong industrial base on the basis of which you could generate exports. So kind of keeping Sri Lanka in its traditional position of being a primary commodity exporter, but now you landed up in a situation where even for primary commodities, Sri Lanka has become dependent on uh, imports, uh, food, fuel, etc. Everything it has become dependent on imports. So, would it be correct to say that trade liberalisation, in a sense, blocked rather than facilitated the development of uh, an adequate uh, range of exports from Sri Lanka? Exactly. So, particularly liberalisation of agriculture, um, because in the 1970s there was a kind of increase in production of vegetables, food grains. Um, in fact, by 1980, we finally became somewhat uh, self-sufficient in the production of rice, which is a staple, which was a major achievement. But that only happened because of major struggles in 1953 when they tried to uh, increase the price of rice. So from 25% self-sufficiency, we went to 90. But on most other uh, food items, we became even uh, items that we were already producing, it could be railway carriages, which didn't import substitution really. Everything we started importing. And I think along with this uh, trade liberalization, there was also a conscious move, uh, I would say imposed by the Breton Schools institutions, not to have an industrial policy. We uh, don't really have an industrial policy. We had two development banks in the late 1990s under pressure from the IMF. They were made into commercial banks. So the idea of industrial development was very systematically dismantled uh, along with this uh, dependence on uh, imports. So, you know, in addition to primary commodity production, the only sector that we got into with liberalization was the garment industry. And we know that you know, it's a very exploitative, footloose uh, industry, where but it also led to huge changes in our rural-urban relations. You know. uh, women, in particular, had to go and stay in the free trade zones. And uh, so the wealth of Sri Lanka, if we look at, 
it's really created by women. There's a very gendered aspect to it. Historically, the coffee and tea plantations, with indentured labor from South India brought over by the British. So that is one of our primary needs. Um, tea, then also rubber, uh, coconut, those kinds of uh, primary products. Then this garment uh, sector. Then, of course, in the starting in the 80s, uh, migrant workers. Again, women going and working as domestic workers in the Middle East and Southeast Asia. So those were the foreign earnings. But what did we do with our foreign earnings? We spent it on imports, particularly even luxurious imports. So a section of our society has been earning the wealth of the country, and our elite have been squandering it. And uh, the justification for all that is trade liberalization. That's the way to go forward. Somehow that at some point we would automatically diversify and this you know, export-led growth. And we even see that in other uh, you know, agricultural sectors. Now I work with the fishing community quite a bit in northern Sri Lanka. Uh, fishing communities have also been pushed into producing high value seafood for the export market. Uh, you know, blue swimming crab, sea cucumber, these exotic uh, seafood. Now, if you look at our uh, exports and imports, the last 10 years we export an average of 200 to 250 million US dollars worth of seafood. But the irony is that we are an island nation, we have a large fishing community. We import about 200 million US dollars worth of seafood as well. But the food we import is sprats, dry fish, which is, gives the animal food protein for our people, particularly in the central highlands and the internal areas. Of course, along the coast, people get fresh fish. So, which means their nutrition is dependent on imports. Now, we go into a balance of payment crisis like we have now. Okay, we are getting export earnings, but we don't have the foreign exchange to import this seafood which is necessary for our people's nutrition. So it's going to affect the next generation's nutrition. So this kind of attitude towards uh, liberalization and so-called even export-led uh, growth has, is really undermining uh, our society. So you're referring to a process which uh, kind of is founded on a structure of inequality uh, where some people have to generate the wealth and others essentially in a sense uh, or a minority fritters it away rather than developing a sustainable production base for the economy. But how would you explain then the fact that and since this has had a long history, uh, Sri Lanka has had a much longer history of uh, liberalization, neoliberal the pre prevalence of neoliberal thinking and dominance in policy making, then the rest of South Asia is one of the first. But how is it that, that uh, uh, is it a paradox then that Sri Lanka still, on most human development indicators, has a better record than the rest of South Asia? Uh, what explains this paradox? Yeah. So I think, as you would know, in the 1970s, uh, Sri Lanka, along with the Indian state of Kerala and Cuba, were considered development models because we had you know, relatively low per capita incomes, but very high human development indicators in terms of literacy, life expectancy, infant mortality, and so on. I think that was mainly due to uh, the free education, free healthcare, and food subsidy that we had pretty much from independence. Um, I would argue that was also a response to the crisis of the 1930s. I think currently we are going through a similar kind of crisis, possibly globally, certainly in Sri Lanka. You know, during the Great Depression of the 1930s, um, Sri Lanka also went through a malaria crisis, 1934 to 35. 2% of our population died so that a huge response. That was the beginning of the left movement in Sri Lanka. These are young people who went to give relief to the malaria-affected people in the dry zone. 
So it's devastating. And the famine with the depression. So out of that, the younger representatives who were in the state council, still under British colonialism, they started campaigning for free education. So even though Britain didn't have free education up to university here, they said, no, we should have free education from primary school all the way to university, which remains to this day. And all our universities are state universities. I teach in one. All my students have free education. Similarly, by 1951, I think impacted by this malaria crisis, we started universal health care. Anybody can go get admitted in a hospital. I would argue that the, the reason why Sri Lanka was able to survive COVID much better, our vaccination was process is much more robust, was, is because of this universal health care that remains to this day. And we have a very strong preventive health care system. And then during the Second World War, the British also had to ration. They started a food subsidy, which we continued. So all this continued to the, through the 70s. Now, when the Jayavadana regime came to power, of course, they wanted to break that. But the three decades of free education, health care, was so strongly instilled in our people, they couldn't go after that. What they did was systematically reduce the allocations. But every time they tried to bring about changes to the free education system, our student movement is very strong. They've been in the forefront. They get water cannon tear gas, but they have fought to save the free education system. Healthcare, they have started privatizing through the back door, private clinics, but still the best doctors, consultants are all in the public system. What Jayavadana did in terms of the food subsidy, and I think this is a lesson for other parts of the world, is that he made it a cash transfer from you know, the in kind, and then targeted. So now we have something called the Samuti program, which has become so minimal. You know, families get a, a few thousand rupees, Sri Lankan rupees, which is won't even cover 10% of their, or even 5% of their uh, food needs. So it's been so, but because of I think free education and free healthcare system, we have managed to survive. You know, however uh, drastically. Uh, marginalized in terms of actual allocations in the in the budget. About 10 years ago, uh, the Federation of University Teachers uh, Association, which is uh, my union, and I happen to be a vice president of it now amidst this struggle. But 10 years ago, there was a big struggle in, in, in Sri Lanka where the uh, university teachers put forward the demand that 6% of GDP should be allocated for education. In 1970, 5% of GDP, the equivalent in our national budget, was allocated for education. By the last decade, it had come down to 1.5% of GDP. So you can imagine how greatly reduced. This is all education, general education and higher education. So these kinds of struggles have happened to try to somehow salvage it. But really, we need a a different trajectory. And uh, so it is to be seen, I think, these great crises, the 1930s, led to our social welfare system. The 1970s crisis, the economic crisis, the global economic crisis, led in the direction of liberalization, undermining social welfare. Now we are again in the midst of a major crisis. And I don't think we can go in the same direction. Either we go more in the direction of repression and undermining people's needs, or move in the direction of some kind of a progressive alternative. So would it be correct to say that uh, Sri Lanka's kind of high human development indicators are primarily a legacy of the system that was put in place in the pre-liberalization period, and which through kind of political struggles may not have been completely saved during the course of liberalization, but at least the extent of destruction of it that might otherwise have happened has been uh, contained by political struggles so that the public system in a sense still remains uh, despite so many years of liberalization. Uh, so it's kind of 
not because of liberalization, but despite it, that uh, Sri Lanka has these high human development indicators. Would it be correct in saying that? Exactly. So, if we look at, you know, I mentioned healthcare, education, the food subsidy. The food subsidy, of course, is a is a major defeat for our people. We had a public distribution system, which was also dismantled with liberalization. Now, imagine if we had the food subsidy and the public distribution system now, we would be in a much better position to be able to weather this crisis. Um, so that's a huge setback. But even if you look at other services, uh, now in the 1970s, early 70s, our entire transport system was public. But slowly they've brought about private buses and now you see the congestion, the lack of services that comes with privatizing. So we still have the, uh, the Sri Lanka Transport Board, which has public buses, but also uh, private bus service, which creates all kinds of inequality in terms of access to transport. Most significantly, now what is on the cards is, and Sri Lanka is unique, 99% of our people are connected to the electricity grid. And we have a system of uh, subsidies. So a rural household um, would only pay about uh, 500 rupees, Sri Lankan rupees a month for their electricity. In, in today's uh, uh, currency in, in US dollars, just 1.5 US dollars for their electricity bill. And they can get six, 60 kilowatt units. So that has an impact on education. You know, children can study at night. They have running water from their wells. All of this is there. But now what is at stake with this crisis, there's a huge push to privatize CE, to break it into you know, three, to generate, to transmit, and to distribute, and then try to sell it. They want to privatize generation, big actors like the Adani group are now entering uh, Sri Lanka. So these kinds of changes, if it's not thought through, and if it's not done with a view towards addressing the people's needs. So the argument they make is, CEP is running at a loss. It's not running at a loss, it's providing a subsidy. That should be allocated by the government, but this kind of ideological attack and to push for privatization. My worry is that, you know, a decade later, 30, 50% of our people may not have electricity, right? So I think with this current crisis, utilities in particular, whether it's electricity, water, they've been pushing for metered water, but now then they are trying to make money out of water. These are very essential services, so those are at stake. So what you are indicating is that there is a push uh, towards solving the crisis uh, that is being currently faced, but in a sense worsening the crisis that the people, working people, in any case are facing. So they are victims of the crisis who are also being, in a sense, want to, uh, that there are interests that are pushing for them to pay for get extricating the country out of this particular crisis. So what are the interests actually pushing that, uh, that kind of a solution to this problem? Uh, keeping in mind particularly the fact that Sri Lanka, officially Sri Lanka is still you know, banking on the IMF, uh, an institution which it has a long history of dealing and whose uh, kind of hands are perhaps tainted. Uh, it has a role in the making of this present crisis, but it's to that same institution that Sri Lanka seems to be now turning to help itself, uh, to help it out of this particular crisis. So what's the kind of political economy yeah. behind this? So, you know, Sri Lanka never had a strong bourgeoisie, unlike say India. And we've had a comprada elite who are very much aligned with this kind of Western interests. And that would explain why, if you look, whether you look at the ruling government, the opposition in parliament, they all claim the solution for Sri Lanka's crisis now, that we don't even have to think about the solution. The IMF has the solution, and we should go there. 
to the IMF. Now, the IMF and the World Bank, I mentioned the World Bank, you know, longer history, going back to 1950, probably one of the first biggest missions of the World Bank in this uh, region. Uh, the IMF, our first agreement starts in 1965, and since then we've gone through 16 IMF agreements, very significant ones in 77 and 78, structural adjustment and the kind of liberalization path. So at periodic moments, the IMF comes in. And we seem to have a very short memory. In 2009, July, soon after the war, we went for an IMF agreement. The IMF gave us a green light. We were able to then go and borrow all over the world, particularly sovereign bonds. Uh, they, they give the green light to create this kind of debt, but also along with certain uh, policy changes. 2016 June, we went for another IMF agreement when the current president was prime minister. And if you look at their recommendations, they remain the same. Of course, fiscal consolidation, but they want to us to float the rupee. And more significantly, the focus has been on attacking state-owned enterprises. The Ceylon Electricity Board that I mentioned, that, that they should market price energy. So if you look at the last IMF staff report, which is made public in March this year, uh, the same recommendations in many ways that they said in 2016, but now Sri Lanka is much more vulnerable, so they have much more leverage, given that also we have a comprada elite that is all too willing to go along with the IMF recommendations. And who's going to pay for all of this? It's our working people, and not just immediately, over the next one or two generations, we are going to pay for this. So the, in terms of the kind of policy thinking in Sri Lanka, there is a vacuum. It's completely dominated by think tanks who are, you know, whose staff are educated in uh, sort of neoclassical economics and with a very neoliberal view and the elite who are happy with that. And the working people who are in the forefront of struggle, but our trade unions and there's no strong enough left political vision to be able to challenge it on questions of policy. And so, so that's the, the real uh, vacuum and challenge for Sri Lanka. Now, how do we think of alternatives out of this crisis? How do we uh, challenge the uh, this sort of IMF trajectory that is being shut down on us and to realize the dangers and to change course. So uh, what you're saying is that in a sense the this particular trajectory of development in Sri Lanka where it became increasingly import dependent and uh, relied on capital inflows of different kinds to make up for the deficit in its uh, foreign exchange uh, earnings uh, this essentially was the result of following the prescription that the IMF prescribed and the IMF sanctions in a sense helped get the capital inflows which allowed this process to continue this time. So the IMF in a sense is the real culprit uh, in the making of this particular crisis and now is trying to use this crisis to push whatever little is left of its agenda as far as Sri Lanka is concerned. Would it be uh, a correct description of the history of the crisis and what's the process being played, that's playing out itself out now? Yeah, so the IMF, particularly in terms of pushing for uh, capital account convertibility, has had a huge role, particularly in the last uh, 15 years. But I would say it's a nexus of the IMF, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank in terms of the kind of infrastructure they claim that we need. So we are forced to borrow, but we've invested in all this infrastructure which is not providing us the returns, the urbanization mindset. And also, I would say the Bretton Woods institutions in nexus with 
global finance capital. Because somebody has made a huge killing out of this crisis. If you look at it, uh, if you look at our external debt, about 53% is commercial borrowing. Or out of a total debt, 40% is sovereign bonds. Now if you look at our sovereign bonds, which we only started floating in 2007, only as a 15 year history, um, our average interest rate is about 7.5%. On the sovereign bonds, they have five year terms, mostly 10 year terms. So in 10 years, if you do the compound interest math on 7.5%, your interest payment is equivalent to your principal. Yes. Are we getting those returns? What have we done with all that? We have used that for infrastructure development or used that for in exchange to buy luxury items. In the meantime, somebody else has doubled their capital. So it's the nexus. So uh, you know, it's the nexus of these international financial institutions, particularly the IMF and World Bank, the, uh, the big mutual funds and the big you know, uh, gainers from finance, in terms of finance capital. And I would say even the rating agencies, because what, what are but the justification for these policies, I said, well, unless you move on these policies of fiscal consolidation, opening up, that the rating agents would also reduce your ratings, then you won't be able to go in, borrow more. So that is the real trap that has pushed us into this crisis. And we seem to be told that we can still move in that direction. And if you go for an IMF agreement, then uh, our ratings will go up. And we are told we'll be able to go back and borrow. But I think with the current global conditions, that's that's a myth. It's going to be very difficult, unless we are willing to pay 25% <laughs> interest or uh, something of that order. I, I heard that uh, Ghana recently floated uh, a three-year sovereign bond at 26%. So you can look at the extraction that is also happening in this process from countries like Sri Lanka. And then somebody has to pay for that. And it's our working people, as I mentioned, and particularly our women who have you know, their sweat and toil which has brought these, the wealth of this country. And then it's being squandered. And this works at many different levels. I work more in the rural economy. After the war, as, and particularly over the last six years, there was a lot of finance coming into our local finance companies from outside supposedly from you know, development aid and so on, which was then brought to the rural areas microfinance. Now the, the interest rates they charge for rural women, they target mainly women, 60% to 240%. Are they going to get returns of that scale from doing some self-employment? That's given as the solution. So we see this extraction. I can see it happening from a very small village to nationally, and it all goes back to Wall Street and the city of London, in a sense. You can almost trace that. And, and this is the uh, predicament that countries like Sri Lanka are now caught in with the kind of you know, so What you're project. describing is a kind of parasitic process where uh, money comes in, but it doesn't really help in creating any kind of a sound productive base, not a production base which will generate, say, even export earnings, foreign exchange earnings in the long term, but simply kind of feeds off what is uh, existing. Uh, but uh, two things I'd like you to just uh, briefly touch upon in understanding the origins of this particular crisis. Uh, one is this whole story about so-called the Chinese dead trap. Is that uh, kind of attempt at deflecting the real story, uh, blame from where the uh, crisis actually originates? And second is uh, Sri Lanka has had a history of internal conflict. Uh, what is that? Did that play any kind of a role in the making of this particular crisis? Yeah, I think the, you know the, the Western media and maybe to some extent Indian media also has been pushing this idea of a Chinese debt trap. But now if you look at our external debt, I mentioned 53% commercial borrowing, 
only 10% is dead to China, similarly 10% to Japan. Nobody's talking about a, a Japanese debt trap uh, because it's really not a Chinese debt trap. At the same time, I think whether it's you know development aid from China, from any other multilateral organizations, because we didn't have a proper policy direction or what infrastructure we need. So it can be from any actor. Of course, they have their own interests. They come and build infrastructure. So we have to set the direction. Otherwise, we won't get the returns. It can be Chinese aid. It can be Indian aid. It can be anybody's. And what the, the great worry is that we've been told that we shouldn't think of the kind of economic trajectory that we want. We, we have got the habit of just accepting whatever comes. So in that sense, all this kind of development aid has also contributed to the crisis because we have not set it in our terms. Um, so, so we need a shift there. We need much more debate about policy within the country to be able to set the trajectory. Now, in terms of you know the, the 70s, the situation won't be this bad, but of course the uh, ethnic conflict and the civil war probably had an impact of maybe halving our GDP. It was a 26 year long, it's a long war. You know, I say that even the World War II was only six, seven years. And in the north where I live in Jaffna, we see that impact. 26 years, two generations are affected. So there's intergenerational impacts in terms of education. There's various impacts. So in that sense, we've suffered quite a lot. So it is unfortunate because when we finally came out of the war, instead of addressing that and addressing the inequalities in the country, and people were told to tighten their belts, instead of addressing all of that, we were set again on this notable trajectory of greater unequal uh, development. So we still have to come to terms with that. What is encouraging about the protest movement that has emerged now is that so far it has been inclusive. The Sinhala youth are there, the Muslim youth, the Muslims also came under a lot of attack in this sort of very uh, Islamophobic or anti-Muslim kind of attacks that the Rajapaksa is encouraged to deflect away from this unequal development. Because I think neoliberal development always comes with a neoliberal state, an authoritarian state that also divides people to be able to go forward with their agenda. So the Muslim youth have joined. And even Tamil youth from various parts of the country are part of this struggle. So there's a political dimension to the kind of, you know, the economic exclusions and the economic inequalities. And hopefully out of the ongoing struggles, we'll be able to set Sri Lanka on a on a different path um, where inclusive uh, sort of development thinking takes hold and we try to uh, work towards the interests of the working people in, in, in Sri Lanka. So uh, uh, briefly about the kind of political dimensions of uh, this crisis. So you are of course describing a situation in which there is a widespread kind of movement demanding change in direction. But of course it's a crisis in which there are several players, each of whom would be uh, seeking to take advantage of the crisis in different ways to push in different directions. So you have a, a local great uh, which is tied up with the past trajectory of development and perhaps wants to keep that going, uh, which is in obviously still controls the levers of power even if nominally uh, people change. You have the international system and um, the IMF which is also holding key levers particularly in the context of crisis. And you have the people protesting uh, but perhaps not yet, don't yet have a organized political force, have not yet become that kind of an organized political force which will force that uh, kind of change uh, or bring about that kind of change. So how do you see this particular process evolving? So there's still a struggle 
within the crisis also in terms of what is a genuine solution for this crisis. How do you see this dynamics kind of playing itself out? Because as you said, the major political formations in Sri Lanka so far, they are all implicated in this uh, process. Uh, they are not going to be really the agents of change. So how do you see that process of change really politically emerging out of this uh, crisis? If we look at Sri Lanka's history, uh, the working people, as, I, as we call them, uh, uh, a colleague of mine, Devaka, and I have been uh, developing this concept of uh, working people, because our uh, economy is mainly informal. At crucial moments, they come together. And it is related to also about social reproduction, the kind of economic issues that face them. To be able to, and they come together to overthrow regimes. We saw that in 2015, when Mahindra Rajapaksa was very powerful after having won the war, but he was thrown out in the elections. And now we saw that last month, when uh, Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who had a landslide victory as president, was chased away. So people come together. But even you know, four months ago, when the struggle was really starting to take hold, it uh, became very clear to us that this sort of disparate set of actors coming together, that the trade unions have an extremely important role to play. Because trade unions have a longer history. They have you know, a membership. And they can be the kind of rudder for a movement like this. And, Glad to see that the trade unions, various trade unions, the teachers' unions, uh, our union, the university teachers' union, various industrial workers' unions, state unions, all of them came, and that was how it forged. But we are yet to forge an economic trajectory for the country. That clarity hasn't come yet. But I also see this crisis as going to be very long drawn out. We are probably looking at a lost decade. And I think there's going to be a lot of political changes over the next few years. If you know, I make the comparison with Greece, the 2010s was a lost decade. They had seven different prime ministers. So we've already had, I think, three prime ministers. Now, you know, we are going to see changes like that. And along with that, I think there is a possibility of a new uh, political force emerging out of these struggles. We hope that would happen. And the elite are working over time under the leadership of the current president to uh, crush the protest movement and to try to go back to the old neoliberal trajectory. So ultimately, I think it's, a, as Marx would say, it's, it's the question of force between different these two different constituencies that will decide the future of Sri Lanka. So, well, my final kind of question to you is, you, know, you talked about the working people. Uh, could you kind of elaborate a little on which are the classes in society which make up this uh, category called working people? And uh, they must be there in different sectors of the economy, and particularly, what's their position with regard to the agrarian sector in Sri Lanka? which is not so much talked about in most common discussions, but of course it's important because part of the crisis relates to uh, the agrarian sector itself. So who are the kind of classes that make up this category called working people in the Sri Lankan context? Yeah, of course there's the organized working class, you know, who also form our trade union membership and so on. But if you look at Sri Lanka's economy, over 60% is in the informal sector. And even if you look at agriculture, there are farmers, but there are part-time farmers, people who do farming for subsistence in addition to some cash income. So it's very disparate. There's a fishing community. And what unites them, because they're in very different, a fisherman and a farmer, they're in very different um, forms of productive relations, in relation to landed relations, and so on. What brings them all together is a question of social reproduction. Meeting their essential needs to be able to reproduce themselves for the next day. And it's crises like this 
it is also a crisis for social reproduction. Yeah. Essential food items, the future of having electricity or not, having fuel for your uh, tractor or it might be fuel for your uh, these small boats, outboard motor boats. Those are the concerns. Or the informal uh, workers in the, in the urban areas, they have, they are coming together. The protest movement so far has been much more urban-centered, but I think that there's this reserve of the agricultural, the fishing communities, who are also likely to enter the struggle in the, in the months and years ahead. Them coming together at crucial moments, but that is where I think the question of social welfare, of you know, being able to provision their food, the access to healthcare, and education. Now people have a very strong sense of entitlement about these concerns and, and those coming together is what creates a working people's politics. So let's hope that uh, uh, while you are describing a context which is going to be difficult for Sri Lanka for some time and for the working people, let's hope that finally you will have an assertion of a politics that is rooted in the interests of the working people rather than the working people being made to choose between different representatives of, a, of an elite which is kind of beholden to uh, international capital uh, and uh, basically taking advantage of uh, the working people's efforts to sustain its own position. So let's hope that uh, finally they will be out of this process uh, uh, and I'm sure intense struggle. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but let's hope that the working people will be able to assert themselves in shaping what is Sri Lanka's way out of this uh, crisis. And I wish you, particularly since you're involved in that uh, struggle, the very best for that uh, particular task. Thank you for talking to Thank me. you so much for sharing your views and thoughts with us. Thank you.